Producer will be uh, first person uh, who will be speaking is uh, uh, Professor Kanye Nook of Kyunghee University. Yes, right. Uh, he is currently a visiting scholar at the University of Pennsylvania. Yeah. Uh, and so we're very happy to have him. And he will be, I guess, uh, Han Jin Sung. Yeah, Jin Sung, my, my student, but she, she is in North Korea. Uh, she's not, yeah, not able to attend. So, and he'll be talking about Shungnu of the Mongolian Steppe and its role in the dual structure governing system of ancient Korean states. Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Kang Inu from South Korea. It's my great, great honor to uh, have this chance. And thank you, Saru, and thank you, organizer, to having me this one. You know, Shungnu uh, is the recently, Shungnu archaeology is rapidly becoming globalized and its education is very increased. Over the past three decades, Shungnu archaeology has been going through, I can say, era of discovery. There are so many, so many excavations with the joint discovery from Korea, Russia, and many Western nations. But it's not enough to properly explain the characteristic of the Shungnu archaeology in the context of East Asian uh, history and archaeology. And the new task for Shungnu archaeology is to rebuild its network with uh, the Manjuria and the Korean Peninsula. Yeah, maybe uh, so. Uh, my presentation looked at the relationship with Korea and uh, it's the new paradigm for how Shun uh, contribute his role uh, in the Korean and Manjurian archaeology. Uh, it has been very well known that the rise and fall of Shun has great influence in Siberia and uh, you know China. Okay, let's uh, take. Oh, yeah, but I yeah I don't use the Apple MacBook, so I'm very the very poorly the uh, mini play. Sorry for this. And this is my the uh, the last ten years project. Uh, first of all, I conducted two pro uh, three years project with the, oh. Oh yes, I got it. Uh, project with my Mongolian colleague in Russia. And the second is my, the, another project of, to publish our the introduction to Shungnu and Mongolian archaeology in Korean. And now I'm uh, carrying on another new project about the uh, Mongol, the collective works on art and craft work of Shungnu. And in this, in this the last, last work, I will talk about uh, in detail what was the, uh, the concrete role of the Shunu in Korean archaeology, Korean history. So, you know, I'm so nervous to make use of this MacBook. Yeah, and this is a scheme for the uh, uh, Shunu and its their neighbors. You know, the very, it's famous that the West is Hun, the Huns in the Eastern Europe, and the North should be Baikal and Southern Siberia, and the South they relate with China. It's very well known to everyone. But how about their relation with East Manjuria? And you know the so so called the Korean ancient history, Buyo, Goguryeo, and many the three kingdom period. That's my question. And here is my uh, current research. Okay. And that this correlation I will locate on this on the whole map of the East Asia. And firstly, Shungnu, that influence the Korean Peninsula could be divided into three stages. And the early period and the golden age of Shungnu, and after the third will be the post Shungnu period. So I'll talk about the, uh, the chronological sequence. Uh, first of all, uh, the, what should be uh, the first period, the, the early Shungnu? Uh, as you see, uh, these faces uh, are shown. Uh, found from the Beijing, uh, from the Wari state of China. And this is the famous the Noinula. All they has the you know the European the uh, faces, and it is about the fourth, the third the century BCE. And this time uh, it was originate from the Central Asia. I call it the Saka Saka style gold and the bronze. Uh, and this, uh, this flow, inflow of the Saka culture located on the uh, Great Wall region of China. And I think 
there should be uh, the first uh, appearance of the shun. And this was very, very well shown in this famous the gold uh, diadem from the Orodos Plateau, from the Aluchaida uh, site. And in this period, they had shown very uh, little uh, uh, artifact to Korea. But, you know, uh, in this route, it is not, not, so, uh, not so strong. And I think that there should be a uh, network, but not for the uh, not for the uh, the great Shunu. And the second period, yeah, it's very very important and uh, interesting network in this uh, time. Uh, you know, Shunu made a big empire, as you know, the northern Shunu made, uh, and the Mongolia and the, the influence going uh, everywhere. And uh, it showed up the so many the archaeological artifacts that are found very similar thing uh, around the Eurasia. First, I show you this kind of the flying horse uh, ornament. It, it, it was the southern Siberia, and the central is from Inner Mongolia, and uh, below came uh, from Manjuria. So he was very, very concerned with the Xiongnu um, Confederation and its influence. So, uh, I'm sure you this one, the, the left one is the Xiongnu uh, tomb, and the right one is the location uh, on the map. In this period, Xiongnu's influence made a new uh, nomad culture, made uh, called Xianbi. And Xianbi, they locate from Daika until the Manjurian. So, I'm sure you their the, the location. And recently, this can be also found on the Shis Baikal region. So their influence is very, very big, not only to China. And the second is also Joruba culture, also the, a little bit uh, right from the Shis Baikal. Uh, and, uh, yeah. And this one is the, another Shanbi culture uh, located on the Heilongjiang. Uh, you know, this is located on the east of Mongolia, and they are bordered with the Heilongjiang and Horunbeyer steppe. They also found this kind of the Shunu influenced Shanbi culture in this period. So it's very, very widely known. And how about to Korea? Let's go to Korean. Uh, they, the, the full circle is the territory of the Buya state. I think that's the, the, one of the early states in Korea. And the western part of this Buya territory also found very, very similar to Xiongnu culture. And this all shown up from, the, from excavated from Chicago site, which located the western Liaoning. You know, uh, if I mix the, with, the, uh, with the Mongolia, Nobody, nobody notified that it get, they came from the uh, Manjuria. So this is the first uh, evidence of the Xiongnu inflow to the first state of the Korea, Buyeo. Okay, and how about the, the south part, of the northern part of Korea? Okay, there's another case of the whole strip panda. It came from uh, Golmot, your famous uh, Xiongnu tomb. And this uh, came from Nangnang or Lorang, uh, you know, the Han Chinese prefecture in the North Korea. So the influence go, went to the north and east and the, uh, so, south of the two. And another, another simple of the, uh, sample of this case, this also gold bell hook made by polychrome technique. And, you know, the below came from uh, South Korea and the center came from Xinjiang of the, you know, the Silk Road of the China. And the all it came from uh, the, on the boundary of the Xiongnu's network. So it's very natural that uh, Xiongnu have uh, gave some strong uh, affinity to Korean Peninsula. Okay, and then there's my next question. How about the inflow from Korea to Mongolia. I found some very strong evidence of the Korean evidence. That is settlement. Uh, you know, uh, this, I, I take, took a picture. Yeah, that's not Korea. Uh, don't, don't be scared. That's from the China, in you know, North China. Uh, we call it the Ondol or the 
floor heating system of the house. Uh, if you have been in Korea, you can see everybody live on the floor. And uh, this kind of the system, it originates from the north, northern part of China, Korea. And you can, we can excavate this kind of the uh, ondor or floor heating systems. And the left was found from Heilongjiang and the east found from the central part of Korea. So it's very typical to every, in every part of the Korea. And we also found this kind of floor heating system in Mongolia, Xiongnu Fortress. The famous Xiongnu uh, Fortress from a biker, uh, there is Ibolga. You, may, you might have been there. If you may visit the Buryat and Ulanude, it's located not so far from the city. Okay, uh, this is a Google map of the fortress. Yeah, it is famous because it is the first excavation of Xiongnu uh, fortress in 1950 by uh, Davidova, uh, a Russian archaeologist. And this is the instruction, uh, construction of the settlement, and you can find by the same. Sorry. Yeah, you can find the same system of floor heating. It's so it's very strong similarity, but not. I think that's not only the similarity. There should be a migration of the Korean craftsmen to construct all these uh, town. So let's get take a glimpse of the plan of the Ibolga. Uh, if you see, you can find. Uh, some kind of line of the settlement. So, the, all the settlement was built by in the same side, same direction. And all the construction has the same kind of, the, you know, uh, standardized of the settlement. So I think there should be a short time construction of this building, all this town. So I can tell you, <coughs> it is a new town for Shungnu. And they all share the ones construction features we call it Korean ondo. So this very interesting. And but it's not the only case. Yeah, this is just a picture of the excavation. Uh, there's a fireplace and there should be chimney. And this form is very typical. Okay, another one. Uh, yeah, just for take a glimpse. And yeah, the construction uh, reconstruction of the ondo. Yeah, and there's another uh, fortress uh, from uh, Boro in central Mongolia and Durioni. Durioni located on the borderline between Mongol and Buryatia. Every, every, you know, should know uh, settlements, uh, heating system, it's the same. So it should be a short time uh, craftsman construction was carried on when there was a Xiongnu, Xiongnu Empire built their own towns. So it, 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 the, uh, I the, uh, gather all these the plans of the uh, construction. So uh, all, I, I can tell you comparison of this one with uh, Korean ones. Uh, this is the Ibolga ones, and they came from Goguryeo, uh, the north part of North Korea. Yeah, there was a big uh, subterranean dwelling, but uh, everything hung up the even if it just remained this kind of the uh, uh, chimney and the hard place. And this came from the uh, far eastern region of Russia. So where they live, the Puyo and Goguryeo, or you can find the same things. And so I uh, took uh, some historical record about this one, found very interesting historical record about this one. In the first century AD, uh, when Chinese uh, uh, Emperor uh, command Goguryeo, our state people, to conquer uh, the Xiongnu. They flew to the Xiongnu people and they went back and gone away. It means there was a secret, maybe or unseen connection behind the Chinese record, some migration. So everything is coincident of this the connection and there's no any historical record. So just archaeological finding uh, show up show us the kind, this kind of the uh, connections. Okay, so uh, then what is the reason for migration from Far Eastern Asia, I mean Korea, to Northern Xiongnu? 
I think the main reason is the separation of southern Xiongnu. You know, the uh, southern, southern Xiongnu have separated from northern, northern Xiongnu. At the time, they may start to make their own new town, I mean the settlement, sedentary fortress at the time. But uh, because of interruption from China and southern Xiongnu, their system could be adopted not from China, but another region of the sedentary civilization. I mean, there is Goguryeo and Okja, like this. OK, and let's go back another post Xiongnu. You know, in the first century AD, Xiongnu had collapsed, and some part of them group flew into Eastern Europe. It's a thoroughly another story, so I will not talk about that. But uh, this is the after, after uh, collapse of Xiongnu. And I made some uh, groups of people. Uh, people uh, made, uh, formate their own uh, state like this one. And this is the Central Asia Altai. They made a rural national group and post Xiongnu. And there should be Shanbei group, Shanbei. And this one is uh, Korean Three Kingdom period. So, uh, when I take a glimpse about this one, I found very interesting uh, situation. That is Shila. Shila located on this one. And Estalife, uh, located on the central edge of Uzbekistan. <coughs> they had very strong similarity. And all they uh, believed themselves as a descendant of Shunu people. Although there is no any direct connection with Shunu because uh, these Shilla and Heftalite, they built their own uh, Shungnu uh, lineage after 300 years of Shungnu college. So I will explain about this thing. Okay, uh, uh, there's uh, some kind of the archaeological uh, the artifact. It's from uh, Altai, Roran, Ashina groups. Okay, I will not talk about in detail because this is not only for archaeologists. And this is, came from the uh, post Xingnu period in from Loran. And yeah, it's very just uh, very rarely uh, found, but very interesting because it, they all they have strong similarity with the uh, East, Eastern Europe, Avar culture, but it's a different story. Okay, let's get back on to uh, Korea. And you can find this in this area, there was a uh, step or Xingnu style culture from the Mongolia, and they made use of this kind of big, long sword, and with this kind of characterized, uh, you know, pommel. And two years ago, we found it, the same one, in the center of the Korea. Nobody expects about this uh, artifact. So uh, let's get, let's get this artifact. Uh, yeah, this is the, we, we call this state Baekje. Baekje is one of the nation uh, who came from the Buyo. And all, except this sword, there is no any such evidence of similarity or the influence from Xingnu. So, uh, we uh, take the uh, examination of the old artifact, but except this uh, style sword, everything is just uh, indigenous. Artifact. So uh, I was very wonder how can they get this one? Maybe this kind of import or some another region. Just I mean the uh, maybe the prestige good or present. But uh, when we excavate, when we examine it, we found it very interesting that uh, this Puyo and Shungnu one was made about one century BCE. And this Baekje one, Korean one, was, was used more than 300 years. It was dated to 3rd uh, century ACE. It means uh, the Baekje, Baekje uh, governor made use of this kind of the family treasure, and they used it for 300 years. So let's compare this one. There was an aggressive the commerce, and this one, like the new one. So that was a family treasure to uh, show, symbolize their own lineage came from Xiongnu. 
So that is the secret dual structure. All the elite of the upper society believe themselves as the kind of descent of Xiongnu, but to govern all the southern Korea, they just hide them. So except this treasure, everything should be a indigenous culture. And so, uh, this is, this is my the, uh, assumption. The significance of Xiongnu state in ancient Korean state. First, is the sedentary and nomad culture in, the, in, one, country, in one state. Uh, breaking of the trade system with China and independence of the native tribe may cause change of state system in northern Xiongnu. And so they need self-sufficient economy. That's the reason why they uh, invite migration from Korean craftsmen made themselves town. And it also initialized the dual structure of early state of Korea. Nomad style prestige good made Shunno lineage in three kingdoms of Korea. So uh, it's, kind of, it's my the scheme of my the, uh, yeah, model. And I will talk about uh, in, I, I think, I, in, in next my maybe the, in another symposium. So uh, there should be two groups of the uh, connection Shunno with Korea. And the first, the early stage is very, very observed. So I, I cannot find anything, but the, uh, at the golden age of Shungnu, there should be uh, some uh, Puyo and many uh, nations of Korea should be correlated. And the third, after the Shungnu, there should be a Baekje, and I play the Shilla. They were, uh, in spite of the uh, no relation, uh, Although there is no direct, direct uh, relation with uh, Xiongnu, they had the self-confidence of lineage and they share the prestige good. So uh, this is the, okay, I my the uh, on the scheme of the lineage. The lineage of the Puyo lineage should be uh, this kind of the artifact and they date to be the first century BCE. And the next step, should be Shilla and Baekje. Self-confidence of Shinnu descendants, and they shared many steps originate material. But it's very, very interesting. They are different ages, different times. But all they believe themselves as Shinnu. So uh, they share the dual system of the governance. But uh, the uh, origin of their dual structure should be uh, very, very different. So, uh, like this. This is the, uh, you know, the one century, one century uh, BCE, and after that, after Xingnu Korea, there should be another uh, wave of the Xingnu in flow to Silla and Hekje. So all about the five century uh, BCE, uh, five century, Xiongnu made very big, uh, no, long contribution to Korean ancient, uh, Korean ancient history. Unlike the Central Asia, there was no large migration of Xiongnu to the Korean Peninsula. But their impact was very significant in the state formation of the Three Kingdom period in Korea. I name it as a dual governance structure because uh, it could be an explanation for the state origin hypothesis. So far, many Koreans believe there is some uh, connection with uh, Xiongnu, but very confused. Different time, different period, and different origination. And I thought there was, should be a very, uh, uh, you know, in different context, there should be another uh, correlation. So one is the Puyo style correlation, the second should be the South Korea. So like this, uh, this kind of the correlation should be uh, made. Very big contribution in Korean uh, ancient history. So uh, I think that it's very important to point out that uh, all these things, all this correlation was not shown in historical record. Only archaeology show up the unseen connection with the uh, Xiongnu and uh, South Korea, and not only Korea and Manchuria. 
So there should be more to come and more to figure out. Thank you for everybody. Thank you.